Luke 2, 52. We're in an incredible season. Fighting a little bit of head congestion. The devil is a lie. Amen. We're in a season where we celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the actual time he was born. He was, most theologians and archaeologists believe that it was sometime in the mid of summer. But we've chosen December 25th to celebrate the entry of our King, our Christ. And uh, it's a time, it's, it's interesting that the season of the holidays that all the stores go debt free or get in the black and they call it what black what <clears throat> black friday <clears throat> and uh i said lord even even the world benefits from 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 us worshiping you but i want to talk to you because i believe that <clears throat> there's coming a place where we've got to know how to unlock the supernatural we need the supernatural. Look at somebody and say, we need the supernatural. I mean, I'm going to turn my mic off just for a second clear my throat. Let's see if that helped. Hey, yeah. Uh, now, if I could just stay on tune, I'd make some money today, huh? <laughs> Can't see. <laughs> Don't you hate the cold weather? It makes everything go out of bug, gets all buggy up. Oh, is that mine? Mine. Oh, yes. Yes. I want you to, on the way out, pick up your shirt. It just came in. Look at it. Unto us a son, for unto us a son is given, and then it says the word forgiven. On the back says, somebody shout. It says favor. So, I think from uh, small to large, small to extra large is 15 then double X, it goes up $2, and then if you go to the 4X, it goes up two more dollars. If you want it cheaper next year, make a New Year's resolution. <laughs> go ahead and laugh. You can laugh. You can laugh. <laughs> Well, just this is a, a good, this is a, I guess it's so dampered outside it feels, man, we bind that dampered spirit in here in the name of Jesus. We're going to spiritual warfare. We're taking our minds back in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. I want you to read the text with me. Look up at the board if you need to. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. We'll start in verse 51 and hit the 52. And it says, then we went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them but his mother kept all these things in her heart what things and then she said this is what Luke said and Jesus increased or grew Jesus grew in wisdom he grew in stature he grew in favor with God and with who <clears throat> now I want you to take right down to thought today it's continuing from Wednesday night, the sequence to favor, the sequence to the favor of God. Everything we do is focused on favor. All success is attached to favor. You didn't get a pay raise. You didn't get success without favor. And I believe that we can have man's favor, and we do that through self-ambition. We do that through working a principle on the earth that's just natural. But I believe I want to walk in divine favor before I walk in man favor. How many would like to have God's favor first? And so we have to talk about because this is the season where we celebrate the birth of a, of a king who is more than just a savior of the sin of the world, but is the very embodiment of the anointing of God. And so I want to talk to you and kind of just kind of, if you weren't here Wednesday night and you're not making the midweek a habit, you should try, unless you got a work or you have a good excuse, you should try to be here because the gathering, the, apoc the uh, apothecary is the church. And so we have to understand then 
that what was going on with Jesus here in his life and how did we get here and how can we do what he did? How many would like to do what he did, walk on the earth with incredible favor? I don't have, now, when I say we get to do what he did, the one thing we don't have to do that he did is die on a cross. So I want you to look at somebody and say, Jesus died so you could live. So I tell somebody on the other side, Jesus died so you could live. So I want to live for him. I want to live with him and for him. Jesus died so that I could be restored into some kind of position. We talk about being restored. Uh, I wrote a book called More Than Restored, that when God restores something, he restores it more than what man can restore. And we have to understand that Jesus is the embodiment of restoration. And so we must know what happened. And we must go all the way back because Paul calls Jesus the second Adam. And so if, if Paul uses the reference that Jesus is the second Adam, then we have to know what did he restore that the first Adam lost. And so then we must understand that in the Garden of Eden, so walk with me a little bit, just kind of bear with me. In the Garden of Eden, God creates man and woman, and he created them innocent. He created them not babies. He created them fully mature. And we have to understand what was God's focus of the garden. What was his purpose? What was the, the, the main thing or main theme of God creating a garden? And the Bible says that God sowed it, and then He let the, he, the garden was in full bloom when he put man in it. So we must know the intention of God. The intention of God was never for man to work. I want you to look at me now because I'm going to go a little bit. was never God's intention for you to slave eight, ten hours a day for four and five days of the best of your time and take taken from your children. God never intended that. Uh, he put man fully a, an adult in the Garden of Eden where it was fully at harvest state. So he made us to reap his blessings. Hallelujah. So he created us to be the reapers of his blessing. And that if we stayed in right obedience to God, the Father, that we would be able to live on the, on the source of the blessing and never have to work for resource. But Adam began to uh, look at things and Eve... And we know the story that the enemy came in and he begins to rob them of their identity. And by stealing their identity, they begin to do something they shouldn't have done. And they ate something that God told them not to do. And when Adam did what he wasn't supposed to do, God shows up. And, they, and now the whole scene is happening where God starts asking two major questions. These are the most powerful questions you ought to answer them you ought to write them down if you weren't here Wednesday you should write these two questions down these two questions came from God and they're the questions that can save your life right now if you answer them question number one he says Adam where are you now God is om omniscient all-knowing so I, I hate when theologians try to say that Adam was lost from God God had never lost anything okay he's all-knowing how can an all-knowing God lose somebody you, it's like, he ain't like we are. You put your keys on the dresser and forgot you laid them there, and you look over the whole house and go, oh, there they were. That's not God. It's like that's how we try to preach God. He's walking around the garden saying, now, where did I place Adam? I lost that rascal. Where did I put him? God is not, it didn't lose Adam. He wasn't asking the question because he had lost something. He was asking the question because something happened to Adam. So he says, Adam, where are you? The answer to this question changes your life. Because if you're honest with yourself, you always know where you are. Now, you might act like you're somewhere else. And you might walk like you're somewhere else. And we are the uh, doctors uh, of dressing up and masking the real us. We don't know how to go to God and say, here's where I really am. I'm broke. Or, here, or we go to God and say, God, or, you know what? Here, here's where I am. I got, I got some issues uh, that I'm trying to overcome mentally. And when I become honest to who I am and where I am, I now begin to unlock how I can be healed of where I am. I think some of the most hardest people to help in the world are church people. 
It's easy to get a worldly guy and try to bring him into the kingdom than to get some of you folk that been in church and read your Bible every day and you think you become a theologian. And so you, you know where everybody else is, but nobody can ask you where you are. And, and, and when you pray, you don't pray for how God to bless you or heal you. You pray for everybody else because you know everybody else's flaws and don't want to look at yours. We have to say, Adam, where are you? And so uh, when you go to the mall, I like the mall for about five minutes. And I, I like to spend. I don't like to shop. So if I don't have the spending time, I don't want to go. But if you go to the mall and you're in a huge mall, I was in a huge mall in Malaysia. I mean, it was like six stories high. I, said, I walked around that mall and said, my wife would be like in heaven. This is awesome. It's huge. It's beautiful. And we're walking around, and, and Raymond, he just trying to find his wife. And we walked this way for a few minutes, then we walked that. And she kept telling us where she was. We're texting her. And I said, Raymond, I said, stop a minute. Don't y'all have, like, information uh, maps in these malls in Malaysia? And he goes, yeah, but I don't never look at them. I said, you just like most of the Christians I know. You trying to find this thing out without knowing where you are. And so you go to that big old sign there, and it's a map of the mall, and there's this big red arrow with a little dot at the end of it, and the arrow says this, you are here. There is the proverbial question of change. Do you know where you are? As soon as I pick up where I am on that map, the whole mall now takes a new meaning to me. And now what would have taken me all day to find, I now have the information to accelerate to it. And this is how we live our lives. We don't want to know where we are. Please don't really tell me where I am because I have to face who I am. But as soon as I can face who I am, I can change where I am. Look at somebody and say, I can change where you are right now. In your marriage, in your life, in your mind, and in your finances. Just like you being honest. Second question he asked Adam in the garden was, who talked to you? This is what he said. Who told you? Because he said, Lord, we're naked. We got no clothes. We're so broke. We ain't got nothing to dress up in. He said, listen, who told you? You were human. That's really what it said. The word, the word naked there was what we, we got skin. And so somewhere God was hiding from Adam that he was human. He was letting Adam experience being like God. That's why the Bible said God sewed tunics. It's interesting to me the word tunic in the Hebrew is skin. God put skin. For all we know, God finally put the skin on him. Little another story, a little too deep. Then we'll back out of that. And so he said, who, who, back out of that one there. Shake your head. Get that one out. I don't want you to just, we'll go there another day. But what we need to know is that God said, who spoke to you in my presence? Because there is a voice that is leading you the right way. And there is a voice trying to lead you the wrong way. And everything I know has a voice. And so when he says this, he says, finally, he says to Adam, he says, here's what's going to happen. You're gonna go, I'm not going to curse the earth for your sake, but you're going to sweat from the brow and create it work. Somebody listen to me. Work is the curse. If you've got to work, we're in the curse. The curse is work. That's why we want... The, the divine favor of God because we want God to begin to bless us in the place where I don't have to work as long to make as much. This supernatural prosperity. But we'll move on. Then he went to Eve and he said, Eve, what did you do? And, and he's going down the line. So Adam said, it's the woman. She talked to me. Now, yeah, who spoke to you? The woman. She talked to me. She told me something different. She said it would be good and pleasurable. And he says, okay, you're, this is what happens to you. Talk to me, Eve. What happened? Well, Eve said, it's the serpent here. He beguiled me. 
He said, okay, let me get done with you. He said, from here on out, you're going to have birthing pains, and every child every child a woman has, you're going to feel it. It's gonna, you're going to feel it through every ounce of your body. How many women have babies say amen? Even epidural don't do it justice, does it? And, and us guys, I passed out, so I don't know how, you know. <laughs> when I was there, that commercial that's on right now with that guy, you know, is patting his head, that's me right there, man. Next thing you know, I was... I don't even remember one thing. At one point, the camera was filming the baby, and then it was filming the ceiling. So I was trying to, so it's true. And so she had to do labor pains. Then he turns to the serpent. Now we get to the story. He says to the serpent, because you did this, because you beguiled this creation, on the belly shall thou crawl all the days of your life. He said, up to now, you were a magnificent archangel. But now you will always be beneath the flesh of man. And he said, and you shall eat the flesh. On the belly shall thou crawl. And we became its food. The food of Satan is my flesh. I tell people all the time, why should the devil leave your house if you rebuke him with one hand but feed him with the other? And so he said, now I've got a word for you. There's going to be a seed, and it shall crush your head. And when he named the seed, he didn't name it. He called it an it. And so he says it will crush your head. So now Satan has a warfare created by God and he names the seed it. He doesn't give the seed a name because until God gives the seed a name, the seed cannot have a harvest. So that in the whole Old Testament, the anointing of God was in it. Okay? And it is moving around the Old Testament and Satan is chasing it everywhere you read the Old Testament. And every time Satan thought that he had it surrounded, it wasn't it. He'd move it. Aren't you glad that's how God is? And so, but there's a man named Abraham. And Abraham was in Ur. And Abraham was the people after the Nimrod Tower and everything. And in this in Nimrod thing, Abraham is there and he speaks into the voice of a crowd. And Abram hears God and he comes out of the people and he goes and he comes out to hear the voice and now God finds a man that almost resembles Adam. He found someone who heard his voice. And so when he comes out, he starts talking to Abram and Abram starts talking to God. And so that he says, leave your father and your mother and cleave out here to my voice. Come out here to nowhere. I got to show you something. And so Adam brings his, I mean, uh, Abram brings Sarah, Sarah, and they come out, and he brings his family. And the Bible said, and Lot went with them, and they go out there. And so one day this king named Sodom takes down the people of Abram and takes and goes to war. And while he ain't looking, steals all his stuff. And now the first battle of the whole Bible starts right here with Abram. He goes to war with Sodom. Sodom is a type of Lucifer. And he goes to war with Lucifer. And when he gets there, the Bible said he conquers him. Okay? He conquers him because it is on him. Okay? And so when it's on him, it is the anointing. And the anointing, though, it doesn't have a name. And so it's just the touch of God, the voice of God. And so he goes and he conquers Lucifer or Sodom. And he takes all of Sodom's people. And he takes all of Sodom's money. And it's the first time... Add Abram increase in the Bible. And so when increase comes, out comes Melchizedek. Now we start the Luke 252. Because out comes Melchizedek, and Melchizedek is a type of Christ. And Melchizedek comes out because Abram had increased. And so because there's the test coming, the test of the tithe. Okay, it's not a tithe message, but the tithe had nothing to do with the Levitical law. The tithe has nothing to do with the, with the Arianic uh, priesthood. The tithe has something to do with understanding who is your high priest. 
So when Abram says, who are you? He says, I'm Melchizedek. I am the priest of the most high God. Abram said, that's the God I'm following, the most high God. I didn't know he had a high priest. He said, wait a minute. I just increased. Let me give you a tithe. And he takes the tenth of his increase and he lays it at Melchizedek's feet. Now, people miss this part of Melchizedek, but Melchizedek has in his hand bread and wine, okay? Bread and wine. And so he's only the high priest. So he has bread and wine, and he, get, and he feeds Abram bread. He gives him the blessing. The bread represents the blessing, right? And wine represents the protection or the blood, the covering. And then he says, uh, I bless you, Abraham. Only the high priest could give a blessing. He says, I bless you. And so now Satan uh, uh, sees what's going on here and says, oh, here it is. It's on Abram. But then God does something. He makes a covenant with Abram and said, in thee are all the nations of the earth. Now he realizes Satan is cued in on Abram and Abram's covenant because Abram has nothing to do with the law so that God comes over here and he brings a man out called Moses and starts a Mosaic covenant and makes a covenant with Moses with the Levitical law and takes the Abrahamic covenant and hides it in the shadows and has the enemy chasing the Levitical priesthood. Are you with me? And so that in this Old Testament, he's taken it and moving the anointing all over the Old Testament, and it's in the manna. And then when Satan shows up, he said, nah, we're going to move it from the manna to the rock. And then it, and the Bible said, and that rock was Christ, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It said, so he said, no. Nah. And Satan comes to the rock. He said, nah, I'll move it and put it over here, and it shall be on them. And then it was on Elijah. And Elijah, and, but he said, no, it's not Elijah. I move it to Elisha, and he had double portion. So as long as it doesn't have a name, God can move it anywhere he needs to move it. And Satan's chasing it. He's chasing it. He anoints Saul. Then it, here he comes after Saul and he says, no, he's dead. I've rejected him and he put it on David. And David becomes a worshiper. And so we have to understand then that it is the anointing. The anointing simply means the smearing or covering of something. So wherever God put it, it was Christ. It was the Christ spirit. Christ means the anointed one. The Christ spirit now is floating around everywhere. And then God says, we're going to make an anointing oil. And he makes this anointing oil. And he says, listen, in the Old Testament, he says, be very careful how you do this. Follow this ingredient. He said, get me some myrrh. Get me some sweet cinnamon. Get me some sweet calamus. Uh, and get me some cassia. He said, then put it in the apothecary and pound it out into powder. He said, and when you get it in the powder, I'll pour the oil, olive oil in it. And in the oil will come the mixture. And it was a type of the church in the Old Testament. Uh, and said, this is how this thing's going to work. Uh, some of you are going to be myrrh. Some of you are going to be sweet cinnamon. Some of you are going to be cassia. Some of you are going to be uh, 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 calamus. Uh, he said, and then you're going to come into the apothecary, and I'm going to pulverize you uh, until you have no identity. And when you lose your identity, then I'm going to pour the oil on you, uh, and you're going to pick up my identity because you came into the apothecary. And so God's beginning to build in the Old Testament why you're going to need a name. Why you're going to need Jesus? Because up to now, every time Satan showed up, God could just move it. No one yet had the power to face it, the enemy. So as soon as the enemy showed up, God moved it. And then he'd show up, he'd move it over here. But he's moving it on a path to a king that the king become
becomes the second Adam. So that when the second Adam comes and he's obedient, he can give back to the people what he had always planned for in the beginning. For men to be blessed and have authority. That we can overcome every demonic spirit. That we can overcome poverty and bitterness and hurt. When we get into the apothecary and we understand that God is going to bang, bang out all our yesterday paint. Myrrh actually means bitterness. Uh, God said, if you can get into the mixture, I can erase all the bitterness of your past and your pain and your rejection and your hurt and your mind tormenting. And what I don't, maybe you're going through a great mental battle and they say, well, we, you ain't never going to get over it. The devil is alive because of the anointing of Jesus Christ. We can take back every area of how many would like to take back an area of their mind that torment or pain or bitterness or loss or rejection has bedded in there and can't get out if you grab your head and say get out in the name of Jesus I don't care what culture you're raised in. I don't care where you came from. I don't care how smart you think you are or how smart you ain't. If you've got the anointing you got the power to be delivered of everything now, this is kingdom preaching, see? It's not church that, well, you go sit on the counselor's couch and we'll spend hours trying to talk to you about your past and all we do is just keep recreating the memory of your past until somewhere you face yourself in the past and then when you face yourself in the past, you've got to overcome the self that you face. Uh, well, you can do that if you want or you can let a little bit of the oil of God drop on you right now and say what it take an hour for a man to do, you can do right now because you are my creator. And so here we go. One day we get to Isaiah 9, 6. said, unto us a child was born, unto us a son was given. This is Christmas. Here we are. We're in the Christmas season. And so now we have to understand that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and power or in favor with God and with man. And he gives you the sequence to why he had authority and why he was anointed to anoint you. Now, I'm going to tell you one of the most dangerous things in the church right now, one of the most dangerous things in 21st century. And, I, and when I went to Malaysia and I saw the real church operating as the real meaning of the church operated, when I understood that they were under tyranny and persecution and that they can't witness and they can't pass out tracts and they can't put signs on their buildings because it's a Muslim government, when I saw the church being packed out and I hear that they're packing out their houses uh, and I hear that they have, to, they have to do it with the risk of being arrested if they save a Muslim for Jesus Christ and then I come here and I hear all the excuses uh, of the American people that say why they can't go to church and why they got to go and they put their football and their schedules and, uh, and their basketball and their yards and their flower beds and then they say but we're okay with God. No, we're not okay with God because if you don't get pulverized in the the apothecary. Now I want to say something because if you think you can stay home and watch TV or watch preaching every week because you don't want to go to the apothecary, the house of God, you're only going to get one little thing, whatever you are, that's it. Because until he sees the mixture, some of us are Myrrh, some of us are Cassius, some of us, until he sees the corporate mixture, he don't pour the oil. You can only get a part of it at your house. You get all of it in his house. Now that might make you mad. Well, I'm quit. Well, if you quit, I can't help you. But it's the truth. And so now the oil is flowing. The anointing is flowing. And now we go to Jesus in the manger. And now we see the movement of how God wanted us to work ourselves into the mixture. We see Jesus, a baby in the manger. He, he lets us witness that. And how many of you notice that when we read the Bible that they brought gold, they brought myrrh, they brought sweet cinnamon, they brought calamus, they brought, the, he, not the church people, none of the church people knew who he was. Not one priest is there, not one high priest is there, but these guys, uh, kings, kingly people, and the astrologists, the magistrates that looked up into the sky and studied the stars, that's who came out. The people outside of the 
organization. They showed up and they put at the feet the very ingredients of the anointing. Why? Because the anointing's about to get a name. Hallelujah. Because as soon as God can name it, he gets the harvest. Up until now, God had to just move it everywhere, and it finally became him. When it became him, them got set up. So it now is, he takes it, because the Bible said he hovered over Mary, and what did he do? He picks a woman chosen among many, Mary, and, and that's a whole other reason why he picked Mary. We'll come back and talk about that maybe Friday. But um, he breathes into Mary. That's what the Bible said. And the Spirit of the Lord hovered over, and he, what did he do? He spoke into Mary a seed. No, he named it. He named it in her. And what started growing in her was a baby. In the garden, it was fully mature. He said, this time, I'm going to raise my children, not just put it in the garden so Satan can talk to it. And so he, raises, he puts it in a belly, and it grows the seed. And he grows it, and when it's born in a manger, it is a baby. So God let us witness his birth. Then he pulls the camera out, and we don't see Jesus again until he's 12. And now he's a boy. And we are a young adult, boy, right? And we see him in the temple, and he's quoting the word and he's astonishing the priest and they're like who is this guy that knows the Bible that can keep us here all day long talking about God and so God says there he is a boy and then he pulls the camera out and says I'm not going to show you again till he's fully mature why he said because these are the layers of how you're going to grow in the kingdom when you're a baby you're vulnerable he said so though he is my son and he is fully the anointing as long as he's a baby he's vulnerable so he hides him because he knows Satan's coming after it. So he hides it in the wilderness. He hides it. Right? And then he said, I'm going to show you him as a boy. He's a boy, but he's still not fully anointed or fully son. So he shows him as a boy. And he says, now, I'm going to let you see him, but I'm going to pull him back and hide him again. Why? Because though he is now a, a boy, he's still vulnerable, but now he's dangerous. Because if I give him the full anointing as a boy, he's going to make decisions still based on his feelings. And so these are the milk, manna, meat. This is where we grow in our spiritual walk. Jesus grew. So here's what we're talking about. Grow. He grew. He grew from milk, from manna. So that he now is fully mature, he can eat meat. And so God said, when you're a babe, you're vulnerable. That's why you need protection. That's why the church needs to get around you. That's why if you fall, we'll pick you up. That's what babies do. If you drool, we'll wipe your mouth, okay? If, if, you, if you come here and you go back to drugs and then you come back, we say, it's okay. Come on. We walk away. Why? You a babe. We hide in you. We protected you. But then somewhere you become a child. You become a boy. You become a young adult. He said, now you're good. I got a little power, but you're still dangerous. Why? Because you're still, still loving the world and the feelings and the emotions and you still got some knowledge of what I can do and what you could do but you're still going to move in your feelings but when he comes out of the Jordan he's 30 years old so he said I hit him as a baby I revealed him as a boy but I didn't anoint him till he was a man there's no power in the church until you grow up Look at somebody say he's talking to you, not me. He must be talking to you. Look at somebody say he's talking to you, not me. Now, if you're married to the person beside you, don't look because you'll be in a fight all day. But if you're a wife and you've been wanting to tell your husband to grow up, right now's the time to do it. <laughs> grow up. Jesus grew. Here's, a, here's an all-God, all-man person. He's all-God and he's all-man. But God had to grow him. Then he has to train him that he has to operate in the man and never use the God. 
He's deity. And he says, now listen, you cannot use the power of the Godhead. You have to use your life as a man. And you have to, you can't let your feelings get the best of you, Jesus. You got to do everything I tell you so you do what you're told, not what you want. The sign of a fully mature believer is that they now can obey God by what he said, not by what they feel. Because feelings do not have faith. Feelings never make the right decision. If you have financial problems, you are spending on your feelings. That's the proof of debt. That would, we keep dating the same people, it's because we won't conquer our feelings. When we keep going to the same problems and repeating the same issues, uh, it's because we haven't yet got into the apothecary and let God pulverize us into maturity. If we still have racism, if we still have cultural uh, uh, str strengths more than spiritual strengths. When, when I put my children before him, I'm still a young adult or babe. If I put anything before God, he said, I shall have no other gods before me. I can't put my wife before God. I put God first. He is first. Everything about him is first. Everything else is second. What I want is second. What he wants is first. Write it down. What God wants is first. Note takers are history makers. What I want is second. But what we do in the church is flip this thing. We do what we want and then call grace to what God wants. This is what we do. We do what we want and then we fail. Then we call on the graciousness of God and say, I did what I want knowing what you want. Now I'm asking you to bail me out. And his love is so enduring, he keeps bailing you out. Somewhere, though, the consequence catches up with you. And it ain't the devil and it ain't God. It is us. So here's the sequence. Jesus grew. Number one, he grew. He grew. He is the anointing, but he's teaching us how to use it. I've got to grow up. Grew means he increased. He increased. He grew. He grew up. He changed. The proof of growth is change. Have you changed lately? You can't keep giving me the same excuses. You can't use past pains, past hurts. Grow up. You follow me? If you made a covenant, it's a covenant. I'm encouraging you to, to go buy Wednesday night CD or go watch it on the archives or get it on podcast. You want to hear the depth of Wednesday night. I gave you just a quickness of it. He grew up. One of the problems in the church is we can't get people to grow up. You know, how, you know the proof of, of growing up? I can correct you. Can, can God correct you? Can God tell you that ain't right, this ain't right, that ain't right, fix that? You think he's after you. This is what God said to me, Tommy. He said, you know, when I come into your atmosphere to correct you and line you up, it's not because I'm mad at you. It's not because I'm trying to make you miserable. But I know that if you line these things up, you're going to have the most joyous life you've ever had, number one. I'm going to bless it because you'll line it up to me. Quit trying to be your own savior. Grow up. Jesus grew. Now, he didn't just grew. He grew in something. He grew in wisdom. He grew in wisdom. Well, what is wisdom? Write down wisdom. Wisdom is simply knowing what to do in any situation. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowing how to apply knowledge. Wisdom is knowing how to apply knowledge. That's all wisdom is. Wisdom is experience. The longer you live, the more you know. I don't care. I don't know what it is about the, the millennials think that the old people don't know nothing. They've lived longer than you. They know something. I don't care if you're a 21-year-old millionaire. You still don't have an experience. Life has a way of educating you. 
Wisdom is simply knowing how to use the knowledge you get. Wisdom, knowledge without wisdom is dangerous. Revelation without wisdom is divisive. Now, I want to tell you something. You can have knowledge and not have wisdom. A professor goes into a college with all that knowledge and tells them kids there is no God. He has no wisdom. He is full of knowledge and still stupid. Because the Bible said only a fool says in his heart, there is no God. So you can have knowledge and not wisdom, but listen to me. You can never have wisdom without knowledge. The Bible said, Jesus said, my people perish because they lack knowledge. 95% of the people that graduate high school never even read a book or visit a bookstore. wonder why they're so ignorant. You can have knowledge and not wisdom, but you can never have wisdom without what? Knowledge. Are we clear? So Jesus grew in wisdom. So you know what he did? He grew in, he grew in wisdom. You know how he grew in wisdom? He spent from 30, he spent from 12 years old to 30 years of age learning the word of God. He went to rabbinical school. That's why they called him rabbi or master. He went to university. So when he gets anointed, he had been trained. He would served God all that time before he got picked for ministry. Some of you can't serve the church six months. If somebody don't notice you, you quit. And we want to go back to that first, grow. He grew in wisdom. Second, he grew in stature. What is stature? It's interesting. I looked it up. This really got me. He grew in wisdom. But I realized you can have wisdom and not have stature. Stature was this. The word stature in the Greek was he grew in identity. You can have wisdom and still not know who you are. If you don't know who you are, you cannot move in your purpose. If you don't know your identity, you don't know what you're here for. Your assignment and the completion of your life is attached to your identity. People who are always offended have no identity. Why is that? Because if, if you knew who you really are, if I came into you and said, you ain't nothing but a big yellow bus, you wouldn't be offended over that. Why? You know that has nothing to do with you. I ain't no bus. doesn't offend you. You only pick up an offense when you believe somebody. The more wounded you are, the more offended you are. I know that. I had to overcome a lot of wounds. So he grew in stature. Another thing I liked about stature, it said that, that he knew his identity. Here's what it said in stature. He knew how great he was, and he knew how small he was. You know what stature is? You know how great God is in you, but you also know how small you are without him. That's true wisdom. That's stature. I know how great I am, but I know how small I am too. Jesus was the, was the epitome of our teacher. He was the firstborn among us. He done it the way we did it. And he said, I know how great I am, but I also know I can't do anything unless I'm told. I know how small and how great. That way you ain't messing with me. So he grew in wisdom and he grew in stature. Now, because he grew in wisdom, he grew in stature. The Bible said he grew in favor. The word favor is graciousness. These are sequences. We cannot get these out of order. We can't have one before the other. We don't get stature till we get wisdom. We don't get wisdom till we grow up. So we grow, we have wisdom. We have wisdom, we start knowing who we are. We start knowing who we are, we get the graciousness of God, the favor of God. And when we get his favor, we get his favor first. He grew in favor with God, because the Bible said when a man's ways are pleasing to God, he'll make even his enemies at peace with him. 
We spend so much time trying to please everybody else. When we ought to just please God. The definition of misery is trying to live a life pleasing everybody who has opinion about you. The definition of sorrow is trying to make everybody happy. I want you to t t tell three people, I ain't living to make you happy. Tell somebody else, they need to hear it. And if you're really sitting beside somebody, you want them to get it, tell them three times. I ain't living to make you happy. I ain't living to make you happy. I ain't your joy. I ain't the center of your joy. I ain't your identity. I ain't your source, nor am I your resource. And I'm done living a life trying to make everybody happy. Got to make my child happy. Got to make my son happy. Got to make my wife happy. Well, let me rephrase that. I'm only want to make her happy. Because if mama ain't happy, daddy ain't happy. So God and mama. We good, right? We good, right? We got it going on? Okay. Can't make people happy. It's, it, the worst thing in, is a pastor. If you're watching and you're a pastor, the hardest thing to do is pastor a church because sheep think everybody, every sheep thinks they ought to do it, you ought to do it their way. They don't care if God tells you to do it. You just do it our way. No, we got to do it God's way. And if it's God's way and it, it makes you feel bad, that's because God's trying to make you repent. Change. If you want God's favor, you seek to please him first. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's no life like pleasing God. There is no life like pleasing God. Hallelujah. When you get God's favor, he will line men up to favor you. He'll line, listen to me, salesman. He'll line up your sales. He'll line up all your yeses. He'll line up all your blessings. Why? Because you, you sought to please him first. When you please him first in praise and in worship and in church attendance, he says, I'm going to line up to get your house. You worrying about mine, I'm going to worry about yours. It's called the law of exchange. You give me what you got, I'll give you what I got. How many would like what God has? I would make the trade in a minute. All of my stuff for all of God's stuff, it's a done deal. I'm serving a limitless God. If God said, give me your house, we're going to trade. You know God don't need to live in my house. You know, God ain't going to sit up in my TV room today and watch it. So if God said to me, give me that house, I know he's trying to check that favor button. Would he give it to me? Why? Because if he pleases me, I'm going to give him something better. This is the kingdom. But we let some religious, untrained pulpiteers <laughs> teach us that if we believe God for, for best, for more, for favor, that we're out of order. No, sir. That is out of order. If Jesus is my example, he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. If he did it and I am now his representation, then I'm expecting to do the same thing in Jesus' name. How many believe that? Shout amen. Push on my say, you're going to be so blessed today. Today's the poorest you'll ever be the rest of your life. Today should be the sorest you shall ever be. Today it will be the joyless you'll ever have. Why? Because you're going to now have good joy and good favor and good life. I reverse every wrong decision right now in the name of Jesus. I bind every wrong memory, every painful memory. I bind it off of veterans. I bind it off of wounded people right now in the name of Jesus. I am not living in a memory. I am not living to please somebody. 
I am living in the very fullness of the anointing of Jesus Christ because the anointing's got a name and that name is Jesus. Now, I got to go. My time's up. I'm hungry. <laughs> got to get some chicken. I eat fried chicken. Forget that grilled. It don't taste good to me. I eat fried and rebuke the calories. And I eat the crust too. The crustier the chicken, the better it tastes. If I had somebody write me a letter that says, you know, that's just wrong. You should. I said, oh, I live your life. I live mine. <laughs> you want to eat vegetarian? Go ahead. It's the boringest life you'll ever live. I can tell you that. Who wants to go to a buffet if you're a vegetarian? One helping of broccoli, and I'm done. <laughs> Three helpings of ribs. Bring me another. Amen. I got to go. Before I go, I want you to get this in your mind. Where does, where, where does Jesus live? Not where does he sit. He sits at the right hand. Where does he live? We teach this in children's church, right? Mom Roro say, Jesus lives. Where does he live? He lives in my heart. All right, now look up here. If God lives in you, then omnipotence lives in you. Omniscient lives in you. Isaiah 48, 17 says, I, the Lord, teacheth thee the prophet and show it you in the ways which thou should goest. Now hear me, because I'm going to prophesy and send you home. There's coming a place where you'll never make another wrong decision because the decision of God is in you. The greatness of God lives in you. It don't live in heaven. It lives in you. All of God is in you. That means all the blessings in you. All the powers in you. You just got to know how to unlock it. Ooh, glory to God. You ain't never going to go back to drugs. If you don't want to, you don't have to. You don't never have to go back into a bad relationship again in your life. You ain't never going to have to go back and hurt like you hurt. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Is this not encouraging you? I dare you to say I ain't never going to live the life I used to live. I am not living Adam's nightmares. I'm living God's dreams. <laughs> I'm going to be so happy I won't know what to do with myself. I'm going to Krispy Kreme. The sign is on. I feel like buying somebody a donut. Everybody, get to the car. I'm buying everybody a donut. We're going to eat it with a smile. I'm eating this without guilt and without shame. I'm going to be the happiest person in 2017. Who would decree that with me right now? Say, I'm going to be the happiest woman, the happiest man, the happiest teenager in 2017. I'm going to be out of debt in 2017. I'm not going to have these money struggles I had in 2016 because I got the profit in me. The Lord teacheth me to increase. In the name of Jesus, it is done. You believe it? You believe it? Hug somebody. Stand your feet. Hug four or five people. Say, I believe it. I got to hug you and tell you I believe it. Bless somebody right now and hug them. We got to go. Tell them I love you. I'm going to just hug somebody before you walk out. If you're sowing your $65 seed, your Psalm 65 seed, you can lay it up here on the way out. We're taking up from now to the end of the year, Psalm 65, 11, that God will crown the year with favor, that your past may be dripping with abundance. So if you're sowing it, bring it up. We want to pray over it. Usher or grab it. Hug somebody. Bless somebody. I'll see you Wednesday. We're going to get back into this anointing and talk about calamus and myrrh, cinnamon, and all this good stuff. It's going to be good. Love you guys. You that are watching, we love you. Thank you for being a part of the Favorite Center Church. We want you to know I'm favored.com. Get your T-shirt. Order it. We'll order some more on the way out. Get your shirt. We're going to wear them Friday night. We're going to wear these shirts Friday night. Isn't that cool? 
All right, talk to you later, guys. Take us away, guys. Hey, guests, if you're a guest today, meet me in the